Nice work. Um, great. Welcome to join NVIDIA Kinetica Meetup. So my presentation will be first. Um, usually I ask uh, people to ask questions uh, during the talk. Uh, my presentation will be actually pretty short. It will be an presentation. So I'll ask you to hold your questions till the end. And I'll be staying after the meetup. We can discuss certain things as well. So my name is Alex uh, Kozlov. I don't know if you know, don't know me. Then uh, I finished my PhD at Stanford. Uh, accidentally, it was paralyzing AI algorithms. It was at AI and Robotics Lab at Stanford. But then I went away from this topic a little bit. And amazingly, 20 years later, I returned to the same question. I'll be discussing a lot of things about paralyzation of AI and advanced analytics in this talk. I'm not going to go into a lot of details. It's not enough time, but we can, we can definitely discuss it after, after the talk. So you probably came here. The only reason is that NVIDIA produces GPUs, because the topic is how to use GPUs for advanced analytics. But essentially, this is the four pillar uh, directions for NVIDIA. One is gaming which is uh, traditionally uh, the biggest one. It's actually the, big, uh, the largest uh, revenue producer right now. And NVIDIA started with gaming in 1993. Uh, obviously, the, the obvious extension is visualization and visual rendering, uh, virtual reality. And the last two are actually the latest additions during the last four or five years. Uh, AI and HPC, which is also called uh, data center in Wall Street talk, and it's actually the largest growing segment, uh, while gaming is still the largest revenue producer. So Jeff is my boss over there. So does it pretty much sum it up? Uh, you want to add something? <laughs> okay, no. All right. Keep going. Okay. So why AI? So this slide is was taken from. Um, public sources. It's analyzing archive database. It's a Cornell University repository of research papers. And it shows number of papers by certain topics. So we can see that there is a very large increase of course, international increase in computation, computer vision and pattern recognition uh, papers. And most of them are concerning neural networks and particular neural networks on GPUs. And that's why one of the reasons why uh, GPUs are so important. And also we have an uh, increase in NLP papers, and most of them um, are concerned about embeddings, computing embeddings, which is also amenable to neural networks. Mm -hmm. So that's basically how uh, the GPUs and neural networks came about, because in 2014 there was uh, one winner who won the uh, competition on visual recognition, and his technique was uh, uh, GPUs. And after that, the things took over, and most of the uh, winners in the most recent competitions are based on GPU computation in, and based on neural networks. So why neural networks? Uh, so neural networks is basically uh, a sequence of applying weights to certain inputs, and then we sum the results of uh, this multiplication and apply activation function, which is a 10H or logit. So it involves a lot of multiplication. The problem is that uh, the number of neurons and the number of weights uh, can be millions in the neural networks, particularly in the first layer. Right? And that's very computationally intensive. That needs to be paralyzed. And I'll talk about paralyzation a little bit later. The other thing which is convenient about neurons is that are very uh, relatively easy to train compared to other artificial intelligence techniques like maybe Bayesian networks or decision trees. And finally, as has been shown, uh, neural networks can do hierarchical learning. For example, the first layer can learn primitive concepts like maybe spheres, uh, circles, triangles, rectangles. Then it composes into more complex objects like animals, dogs, buildings. And then finally, it can can build concepts around these objects, like a child is boarding a plane, or somebody is building a construction site, for example. So then, I, I was talking about uh, a large amount of summations and multiplication. Then you know, so if you have 
uh, very large computation, one way to speed it up is to build a larger chip with more transistors, more uh, instruction pipeline, and so it computes really fast. But that can, that can scale only so far, and we know that Moore's law, particularly if implication for one chip has been failing, has been flattening out recently. That's why uh, the other way is to basically, if you have a project, then if you know that you're not going to complete it on time, you bring more people, right? And that's exactly what happens uh, for parallelization or GPU. You bring more processing elements, and the idea is you split the job into tasks and assign it to different people or different GPUs, right? So there will be a lot of, a little bit of synchronization. That's where we talk about semaphores, logs, and barriers. Uh, so some outputs of certain tasks are inputs to the other tasks and so on. So it's all nice and cool uh, unless people realize every person who uh, parallelized any algorithm which is not embarrassingly parallel, as people say, so it doesn't really require a lot of communication. Uh, some algorithms require a lot of communication. And then you hit the wall because you need to exchange a lot of data between um, the tasks. So. Yeah, there are different opinions whether uh, it's, there is enough embarrassing parallelism out there if we can do very primitive things like Hadoop or if we need to develop more advanced uh, hardware to process uh, more iterative and data intensive algorithm. It's a question whether the glass is half full or half empty and that depends on whom you ask. But there are great, uh, particularly neural networks which require a lot of data transfer between tasks. And that's exactly where uh, I'm talking about DGX1 uh, GPU workstation, which was announced uh, spin at GTC conference. And that's exactly where I design for <coughs> this DGX1 workstation uh, going. So uh, DGX1 workstation contains four GPUs. Each GPU is multiple uh, processing cores. Um, I think it's 5,000 for the latest Volta GPU. And besides that, between GPUs, we have NVLinks, which are sh shown in green. So that's uh, basically mm -hmm. a hypercube architecture, uh, not fully connected. Ideally, you have N times N minus one, maybe divided by two, if it's unidirectional links between different GPUs. But we have clusters of four, four uh, fully connected clusters and the other four fully connected clusters. And two clusters are also connected by four NVLinks. So each NVLink can support up to 25 uh, gig gigabytes per second uh, uh, transfer rate in one direction, right? As opposed to previous technology PCIe, which uh, was eight or 16 gigabytes, depending on configuration. Um, and in basic, basically, in general, it's about 10, or it can be 10 or 20 times faster. So uh, obviously this one, this, this, this communication will support much better transfer rate and it will be able to show the performance results later on for training uh, neural nets, right? Besides that, uh, we have the standard, okay, we have, uh, sorry. Sorry about it. We have the standard PCI switch, PCI Express, which in this particular case, I believe should be about 16 gigabytes per second, which connects it to CPUs, mm -hmm. and CPUs provide data for GPUs, graphical processing units. Um, and on top of that, which is not shown, uh, this is only one box, right? Multiple boxes can connect into cluster, and then you have, can have multiple units computing the same job and performing the same um, kind of training of the neural net. So if you look, if you look at uh, the, the specs of uh, DJX1 station, Volta, then uh, the cross bisectional bandwidths, uh, or how much you can transfer the data from one part of the cluster into 
on part of the GPUs to the other part of GPUs, basically if you split it into half, it's about 800 gig gigabytes per second. So if you have a eight terabyte disk, it means that in 10 seconds you can basically transfer this much information um, across uh, the boundary from one GP from one set of GPUs to other set of GPUs. And if you try to do it over TCP IP network, usually it takes at least an hour, maybe several hours. Right. Okay. You know, PC products, or is it also on the gaming side? Uh, this is a data center product, right? Uh, right. right. I, 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 there are rumors again. I can only uh, cite public information that that will be eventually percolated into gaming products as well. Uh, uh, just curious. From ten years ago, you had this connect interconnect between GPUs called S SLI. Uh, how does that? How does this compare, or that one compared to this? Uh, SL. SLI, I think, where you can get two GPU cards and you have this uh, connector that sits on top. Right, the, the, that I don't know. Uh, the usual cards that you buy at the store, they connect them to PCIe switch, and that's about 10x improvement over that. Right, so uh, I need to check whether what, you're, what exactly you're talking about. Is it right? okay. So, right. so um, and if you talk about uh, the cluster of machines, connected to infinity band, then the transfer rate for bisectional, uh, bisectional uh, transfer rate for the cluster be, can be up to six terabytes per second, depending on configuration. So that's how uh, the DJX1 workstation looks like. Again, it was just announced uh, six months, almost six months ago, and it started shipping right now. The, Goal things are the GPUs. Actually, the, these are heat sinks, but underneath them uh, there are GPUs. And uh, on the back here, uh, there might be InfiniBed cards, which are not inserted in this particular case. And the front is connected to PCIe, PCIe and the front panel. So this is just basically just GPU uh, chips and and the link. So the other addition in the latest uh, DJX station was uh, Tensor Core. So you can compute matrix products in, um, on standard GPUs, but essentially you have a four by four matrix on the left, let's say you have a four by four matrix on the right, and computing the GPUs uh, basically will take you uh, computing one slice at a time, maybe one row at a time, one slice at a time. So depending how many GPU cores you have, it might also give you speed up over CPUs, but that's essentially um, limiting performance. In the latest uh, product, there are also tensor cores which do it in the streaming section, streaming fashion and in parallel, which increases throughput 12X for simple matrix multiplication. So what do you do if you need to multiply 16 by 16 matrix? you basically have 16 units like that. And uh, typically, uh, I believe the Volta has 160 tensor cores overall uh, for the GGX workstation. So you can scale it up pretty significantly. There is a nice video here uh, in the link here, um, if you click it later, uh, for Jensen giving presentation um, and some animation of the slides, how the computation is done about two minutes. I don't think we have time to do it right now, but maybe later. So again, DJX station is not just uh, a single product, it's an ecosystem or environment. So uh, DJX one station right now exists in uh, Tesla T100, Tesla V100 implementation. So this is the latest one. This is the previous one. But beside that, if people don't, are not ready or want to try, the system, then NVIDIA will provide NVIDIA GPU cloud, which is basically a mechanism to rent it on as needed basis. Um, the GGX machine, or maybe even some smaller uh, machine in small configuration. It will also provide the registry with Docker images. Again, there is an open source product here, product here NVIDIA Docker. It's not a re-implementation of Docker from NVIDIA, it's just a wrapper 
which allows you to use uh, the drivers. Have you seen the architecture is pretty complex, so uh, each release requires its own adjustment for uh, how the drivers use the hardware, and that's exactly that's what NVIDIA Docker is. It sets up the right drivers uh, and the right libraries. And finally, uh, there is a smaller version of DJX1, which is a data center product, which is DJX station, which can fit onto your desktop, um, under your desk, and it contains only four GPUs as opposed to eight GPUs. Uh, that's basically uh, almost all of my presentation. I have a few slides with uh, performance numbers. So uh, if you look at training, I believe it's a ResNet 50 neural network, which is trained on images. And if you run it on DJX station, it will take you basically one day to train ResNet uh, 50 network. The same done on dual socket Xeon processor uh, will take you 711 hours. Uh, unfortunately, the lens is uh, inversely proportional to the numbers, which is a bit hard to understand. But anyway, um, it will take you 711, which is approximately 30 days. So uh, basically one month of uh, training on a typical workstation turns into one day of training. And if you go to DJX1, Volta, then it's actually reduced farther um, by two, since there are twice as many GPUs, and you can train it overnight. So uh, maybe training neural networks is actually um, a simple case for GPUs, because that's what they were designed for, for in the first place, and there are much higher problems. So one of the, the other problems, which Kinetic probably people uh, we'll be talking about is JYP computations and how to apply it in database. But the other thing which people almost uh, always look at is uh, graph algorithms, which are also uh, relatively hard to parallelize. And these are some preliminary results uh, for DJX, uh, uh, DJX1 uh, station uh, module, how uh, the breadth-first search algorithm, graph breadth first algorithm be behave on GPU. So obviously, uh, Volta performs better than uh, the previous result, Pascal, and uh, also uh, you can notice that 64-bit uh, operations are a little bit slower than 32-bit operations, just exactly for the reason of data transfer. It takes much more time to uh, transfer 64-bit basically a flow than 32 bit. Uh, actually double and uh, double, double, I'm really afraid. So this is the same graph for direction optimized BFS. It's a little bit different shape, right? And uh, that's basically uh, concludes my talk here. So the conclusion is that that's the DJX uh, uh, one workstation, uh, it's not a workstation, but the DJX one module is uh, providing about 3x performance over prior generation. Um, uh, there is actually a lot of improvement in thread scheduling in the latest product, which also by itself, it will give you about 30% increase in performance. Um, it analyzes and the links for data exchange. Um, well, it uh, says 10x, but it can be 10x to 20x depending on configuration. And it includes uh, the new Tensor cores, which are improvement of GPUs for operations like matrix multiplication. Uh, that's all for this first part of the talk. So next, uh, if, you, if you have any questions, uh, yeah, go ahead and ask them. Do you have performance numbers against FPGA? Like the neural network training when you compare with the Xeon core, each of that will be compared with FPGA. Uh, for different networks or? Neural networks. Well, I, I gave you the numbers for ResNet 50, which is basically the one published on the website, but uh, a lot of blogs out there for other networks, how they improve. The performance results definitely were very, 
depending on the size of the network. But did you try to compare against FPGA? FPGA oh, FPGAs, um, yeah, I believe there are some blocks out there. I'm, I'm not ready to talk about it right now. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, what, what part of the software stack was optimized for the 30% improvement? Was it the libraries doing the machine learning, or was it some other part? No, no. Uh, I believe uh, there are libraries and we uh, fast Fourier to FFT and uh, a BLAS uh, matrix multiplication. Yeah. What's the what's the size of the when you want to use more than one DGX on the network. Right, so basically uh, scheduling across uh, multiple machines in the cluster. Is it NVIDIA software that manages that cluster? Uh, for the NG Cloud, you mean? No, for multiple DG exports in the cluster. Right. Uh, What's the cluster management software? So we, we recommend, you know, is it? Okay, go ahead, Jeff. Okay. Mesos might be a candidate. So you can use Slurm and other, you know, t typical uh, management tools for multiple DGXs. Okay. Okay. And Slurm, okay. Can you clarify that when you say tensor core, is that, is that, does that mean it's optimized for a tensor? TensorFlow workflow? Or it's basically optimized for matrix multiplication in simple terms. And also, like neural net training uses tensor cores right now. Okay. How does that compare to uh, Google's TensorFlow accelerator? Well, that's basically an idea very close. So uh, I don't have any performance estimates right now. Okay. But uh, we know that the 12x faster than competing just on GPUs. Oh, all right. So you, did, you, you can't compare directly some of the numbers they published uh, at, at the paper they released in June. I don't. I don't have those results right now. So I need to do some more investigation. Any other questions? So with that, we'll probably pass the button to uh, Kinetica people, and they will talk about optimizing other operations with GPUs for fast analytics. Okay. Hi, my name is Mate Rada. Hope you hear me OK. Uh, I work for Kinetica. I'm VP of Advanced Technology. Um, basically, I lead a group that a team that goes out in the field and deploys our GPU database for industry solutions. So we have 30 minutes. I wish we had a little more. We're willing after that to get it in as deep as you want in the solutions and that we're about to discuss. Um, so you may ask, um, you know, what's a GPU database and why do you have one? Uh, why does the world need one? So there are a confluence of factors here. Um, first and foremost, it is the emergence of GPU, but also the emergence of big data, its availability, and the emergence of AI, machine learning, deep learning. Um, we like, we've found that as much as you talk about um, making available um, deep learning, machine learning AI, you can't separate that in the field in um, provisioning for making this available. You can't separate that from traditional analytics. Um, you can't separate that from applying geospatial and temporal dimensions use cases. So we found that the time had come for a unified platform. We have the co-locality of in-memory data, um, GPU and CPU, as, as opposed to more complicated stacks where you have distinct CPU, GPU compute farms, where you also have HDFS where you have different data stores. So again, co-locating all this in a relational database so that you can harness machine learning algorithms, we found that we can execute the throughput of, of advanced um, analytics and then quickly turning that around and applying it to standard analytics. And again, in a denser hardware footprint. So 
we're a massively parallel processing database. Um, shared nothing. Basically, typical deployment is a terabyte of RAM, um, up to two sockets, CPU sockets, and two to four GPU cards. And again, we're a relational database. So we, we can, um, ex we can um, scale horizontally to as much compute power as you need. And basically, when we, when we work in the field and do practical modeling problems, and we'll go into those. We'll first do a hello world practical example type um, of machine learning. And then we'll talk about um, our experiences at a retail company that uses our Kinetica database platform um, for doing a, a prompts engine uh, for club membership, renewing membership, prompting them intelligently, and why, um, why, why we get, obtain more throughput by having a holistic platform. So sorry. Okay. Okay. So again, what what is what is the in the field in the real world? Um, What's the, what's the AI life cycle? It's obtaining data, training it, um, and making it available. Practically speaking, you know, what does that entail? Um, in the real world, again, you get massive amounts of data from streams like Kafka, Storm, Lava, um, or you, ha you make them available in files where you ingest the data and then when you run a model, typically, more often than not, there's significant time spent in pre-processing the data, making it available to a model. Whatever your models may be, um, whatever they're implemented in, TensorFlow, um, Python, C++, whatever language of choice, typically you're marshalling data frames, um, tensors, um, and you start from a source. Again, if typically, if that source is on HDFS, we found, and you have to apply um, relational operations, that should not go in the model itself. You could re, you can extrapolate that, extract it, write it in SQL, do model preprocessing, marshal your inputs to your models, um, doing classical join, union uh, filters, and then in massively parallel processing fashion, um, execute the model, make the model results available. Typically, there's post-processing involved. That's who you can typically do in SQL to refine the results. And this even includes model serving. So again, we do that on one unified holistic platform. Um, in a lot of cases, so Alex talked about certain models can go from days to minutes or hours. Um, we find that a lot of the models we deal with we can get them to minutes as well, down to minutes, but assembling the data can equally take um, hours, days, especially if you use more conventional stacks and technologies. Um, and I'll get into that in a bit. Um, same thing with post-processing. So that's why basically the confluence of all these factors uh, made us uh, basically develop and materialize a, the Kinetica database, which uses GPUs. And just a, another thing I forgot to mention earlier, when we do SQL, um, a lot of the SQL operations are also take place in the GPU, not just the CPU. So again, we're relational database in memory, vectorized, um, columnar store, um, fully optimized to leverage CPU and GPU. So every query plan, when you do a standard query, um, the operator graph produced, it will appropriately use GPU versus CPU. And we can balance um, that, those computing resources to simultaneously ingest, simultaneously do SQL, and si simultaneously do model training. This one, Andre, sorry. <laughs> so again, our aim was to reduce the stack sizes in the field for your model um, pipelines. Um, typically, most stacks have some superset of these components, right? So, 
sorry. Okay, so again, we simplified things so that on one platform, um, you can do analytics, you could do the machine learning. Um, and again, when I say bomb it with streams, and again, we'll talk about it a little later, but we have platforms where we have to support 600 to 1200 queries a second, also run models, also stream ingesting constantly 24 seven. And again, there are advantages if you could do this on one platform. And doing this on one platform ultimately is anchored by the fact that we've leveraged GPUs. And again, we can ingest uh, 2 billion, 3 billion events a minute. We've been achieving those kind of numbers. Those aren't exaggerations. This is on a 10 node cluster. Again, terabyte RAM each, two CPU cards, two to four GPU cards. Okay, we tried, to, we competed in the field against NoSQL and competing SQL stacks um, pretty favorably with a much reduced hardware footprint where those stacks couldn't even achieve some of the um, use cases that we were able to materialize and achieve. Sorry. Two, two billion <laughs> events streaming from Kafka. Um, a minute, okay? So two million events are translate to how much memory? Um, Each event you get a byte, or two bytes? So, so, some events are aggregated, some are applied, stored directly. Again, we're in a memory streaming database. We're also persisting and syncing to disk, right, for durability. Okay. So, um, and again, in this case, we're doing that, and then we're doing that for a retailer. It's all their, um, retail transactions, receipts, whether they occur online or in a store. They're coming in, so in one particular use case, we're every five minutes, so the, the maintained fact table um, be, that the stream is supporting is about 150 billion rows. Um, again, there's some aggregation going on, but we have, in conjunction with this, we have a summary table that results in about a billion rows which we compute every five minutes, and I believe 20 seconds or less, and then that's an index table, okay? That index table supports 600 to 1200 queries a second that are driven by a machine-driven microservices architecture that does um, automatic inventory replenishment, so depending on- So streaming data coming, is this coming over a network or? It's coming over the network um, Kafka Storm, and then gets inserted directly into the database. But Um, I, I'm trying to understand. Mm -hmm. so, so let's say if you have 100 gig Ethernet port that you collect to 12 gigabytes. Um, so, yeah. so in yeah. the offline first you move the data into the host memory and then you try to pull into the CPUs and try to process it or real time you know, you're getting the events? No, real time we're getting the events. We, we, we get it um, again from a Kafka stream. The, the, there's a horizontally scaled set of Kafka servers, small 12 gig RAM uh, messages come streaming in, and we have APIs that they use to land on the particular node according to the data partitioning strategy. When you create a table in Kinetica, you specify partition sharding strategy, more commonly called now, and then the individual data will fall where it needs to. So all 10 nodes, at least in this cluster, are consuming data simultaneously in massively parallel processing fashion. Um, sorry, go to the next one. Um, again, just to reiterate, the, the methodology, basic methodology we apply is any machine learning we take out of whatever you're coding it. And, and again, this says Python, it could be whatever language, but we encourage take out the code where you do non-machine learning processing but again, when we work practically in the field, our experience is people don't do that. They put everything in the machine learning code. Um, aggregation, so, uh, filtering. Um, they even ingest way more data than they should have, which extends the actual um, compute time when you could have filtered previously using SQL. Go ahead. So you're saying they're embedding in their code all the feature engineering to, before feeding into the ML uh, yes. stack? 
Right. Yeah. So in this practical case, for example, um, for membership um, renewal, you know, some of, the, some of these retail companies have hundreds of millions of members, and when you multiply that by the number of credit cards, that's into billions. You, not all of them ha are going, to, not all have to be evaluated. You can knock some out by applying SQL. You don't have to ingest and apply it in the model. And that makes a huge difference in terms of the overall compute time. So when you run a model, in this case it was a non-parametric model, um, should a member, if their membership is expiring, be prompted um, in the next, because his membership is gonna expire. So we, we eliminated a lot of inputs in, by using SQL. Yeah, so you greatly reduced. Isolated to the columns that you want. Right, isolated the columns and the actual observations, if you will. Right, and, and, and the subsequent generation combining some of those metrics. Right. right, yeah. And then we execute in massively parallel processing fashion. Um, the results are written back. It's an in-memory database back to the database, and they're immediately available um, for post-processing and model serving. Again, in most, as, as you saw in my picture earlier, a lot of this work is typically done using distributed components. Um, Spark, MapReduce, HDFS, and there's a lot of latency. And in our experience, uh, when you do it that way versus using uh, co-located data with co-located GPU, CPU, instead of always data shipping. Well, the, any, any operations that have to be in memory will stay there, but when you persist, when you actually insert into a table, that's also synced to disk. But in the intermediate computing, no, it does not, it's not necessary. But when we transfer data, um, let's say you run one SQL statement and you leave it in a temp table, and then that becomes the input for a user-defined function that's um, a TensorFlow uh, model, right? User-defined function is written in Python, TensorFlow. It's gonna marshal tensors through that table that was, the table's right there in memory. It immediately goes in. You're not getting it from across to a, another machine, another file system like HDFS or Spark, which will increase your overall time. And, and we've seen when you're talking big data, some, some some models um, have to process billions to hundreds of billions of rows. If you're not doing that in memory, you're gonna wait an awful long time. You're, in many cases, that's 70% of the time, that IO and, and preparation and file manipulation and moving data around, shuffling. So that's, that's the core of how we approach um, provisioning for model pipelines. Next. Um, and again, physically, this sort of is a pictorial of typically how we deploy. And just in a nice picture, it encapsulates. We do model pipelines in, in the case I keep referring to abstractly. Again, later time permitting, I'll offer more detail. We have um, 10 nodes. Uh, we're massively ingesting in stream, simultaneously supporting um, fast analytics. When I mean fast analytics, again, hundreds to 1,000, 2,000 queries a second. While running your uh, OTP query, OTP no, these are we're analytics. We're an analytics database. We don't pretend to be an OLTP database. We're not beyond, as I mentioned earlier, using indices where appropriately, where they're appropriate. But again, our our claim is again because we have GPUs, very dense compute. You don't need as many servers as you would need if you had a NoSQL stack, and we can do certain work that's just not practical with a NoSQL stack. Go ahead. No, that's the point I was trying to make. So you can, we have APIs where when the APIs themselves, um, when the data is ingested from Kafka, they, they will be bulk inserted into whatever the target is according to the sharding strategy of the table that they're supposed to land in. So it doesn't have to all go through the head node at all. We're multi-node ingest, multi-node stream. Yeah, that's why we scale so, again, um, and we, we, we scale out, we scale out we're, 
And again, it's easier said than done. This is practical. Um, whatever you're doing here, you know, neural networks, um, you know, you, you could be doing classification algorithm, then some factor analysis, and then ultimately do some kind of regressions to produce coefficients that later you want to, again, use with across your data set to predict and score. All right. For each All what kind of network connectivity you have? Um, so be, between, we have like infinite bands between, but again, we men, if you're skilled DBA, by the way, you typically have your data model such that um, all the joins, all the um, unions, aggregations are co-located for the most part. We could replicate tables. So in a classic OLAP model, you have your fact tables. And by the way, you can shard your, your tables more than one way. So that's a feature coming, multiple sharding strategies where some of the data is replicated. But then you, sorry, where some of the data is sharded in different ways. But then your dimension tables, which are smaller, you can replicate them on each node. And then every, there's co-locality there. And again, that increases your throughput. And for a certain class of analytical applications, that time is more than worth it in the ROI you get for this kind of solution. Okay, go to the next. Okay, so my colleague, um, Dr. Zhua Wu, he has a small practical example. Um, and he will show you this. And, and again, it's a small practical example, image recognition, uh, how you would use Kinetica. And then, again, time permitting, I'll show you how we deployed it at a retail customer at massive scale. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, who had a question? So before you leave the architecture, where does the model actually execute? So I understand the database is okay. across this kind of go, go back up one. I'll show you. Um, OK, so the model itself will execute within these nodes. And if I define a table, and I, it'll be sharded. And there are multiple shards. Like yeah. basically, it's a, it's a hash algorithm with, with a modulus, and then it will execute internally here initially on CPU, and it'll ingest data from the in-memory column or store, the user-defined function. Let's say it's a Python um, UDF calling um, TensorFlow. Okay. okay, the data sharded, and then you can start multiple processes on each internal shard, and they'll execute a massively parallel processing fashion. And then when you get to the actual TensorFlow libraries, or any libraries that are CUDA coded, they'll go down to the, the GPU associated. Okay, I think you have a slide on that. Okay, so it's actually running on CPU. That's on my other slide, time permitting, I'm gonna show them. I really, like I said, we could stay as long as you want. I really wanna show you in more detail, you know, we have more granular slides, I can show you that. But again, this is all... I, 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 yeah. Okay, so he will go with his quick demo, and, then, and we want to show you how simple this is. It's going to be a small use case um, on a virtual image of Kinetica, but whatever we show you will scale to the big systems in a massively parallel processing um, setting. Go ahead, all yours, man. Hello? Hello? Can you hear you? <laughs> Hi. All right, so uh, I'm using the MIST as an uh, example. So uh, the reason to use this as an example is uh, first, uh, people who are familiar with uh, deep learning, I, I guess you already tried this already. And uh, second is this is a, a small task, so we can finish all the training inside the laptop. And uh, for the demo purpose, we can turn around and uh, look uh, uh, back. So. Um, uh, here is our administration uh, interface. This is running on a Docker in, uh, on this uh, laptop. Docker image. Docker image. Yes. So uh, first, I want to show you uh, all all this uh, data are in this table. But I'm going to run this code, which will erase all the table and then. Generated. It's not showing up on the screen. Oh, oh. Uh, let me do something. Uh, it's not showing up on his screen. His demo. Uh, I'm, I'm doing something. Wait a second. You may have to exit PowerPoint. 
Yeah, yeah you're on full screen mode. Oh. Oh, exit full screen, sorry. Okay. That's it. I want to see it. Okay. All right. So um, I'm going to use um, um, uh, Minis as an example. So for someone who is not familiar with that, it's going, uh, it is using the image of handwriting numbers and uh, and the training model. So the model can recognize all these numbers from the images, handwriting images. And uh, on this part, this cell as this cell will run. It will generate all the data into pump all the data into our database. As you can see, the number of records are increasing. It's just generating the data set, putting into a table. That's the yes. training set. That's the training. That's before training uh, to generate the table. So we have all the uh, data to train and all the data for inference. And then we can train uh, our model. So all the the cell here, it, it shows a code. Um, it's just uh, two layers of neural networks uh, with uh, 256 neurons on each, uh, on each night. And uh, it's, there's only like a, a few different lines other than the normal TensorFlow code. These are the uh, API calls uh, with our database. So this cell. It will generate a local file. We will use a letter to for register the UDF in the database. And this will generate another uh, file for UDF. And then we come to this part. It will register UDF and then the executed UDF. See if you could flip when you fire this, show them the progress. Sure. So I'm going to train the model. I'm going to uh, register and execute UDF. So this UDF will train a TensorFlow model, and that model will be inside the database, and then we can use that model later on for inferencing. Let's register and run, and let's go back to our UDF. Have to so it's running? So it's running, and uh, uh, it's supposed to take a few seconds, and uh, seven seconds is finished. So here, for demo purpose, I made this uh, uh, training for a very little time. I want to inject one run. point. The data was in memory. It didn't come from HDFS. You didn't have to remotely go to <coughs> each base and bring it to your compute node and your compute GPU nodes. Right, and all the all the data uh, will be uh, all the data model will be generated inside one of the table. And as you can see here, all the you can have the, all the table ID, and uh, here you have all the loss you can compare with uh, uh, different models. So, Tell them how the short, the best stop loss model. Yeah, the shortest. And then, and then you can here. I'm just using uh, pandas, and you can take a look to compare different models. And you can choose the model with the smallest loss, and for your inference. So here will be this one. I just copy the model ID. And then use this model for inference uh, as an input here. Yes, yeah, so the inference now, the data itself, the inference data, and again, this is a simple model. Think if you had a more sophisticated model with a lot of coefficients. Um, but it's available immediately in the database. Now he can immediately use it for scoring. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. And predicting. Uh, yeah, so the model is inside the database as well as all the data is inside the database. And uh, this, this file is written to the local. And then we register from another API call. And then you can go back to our database system and take a look at the UDF status. It's running here. And uh, if we refresh, there is some error. It happens because we are running on the Docker, and sometimes they run out of memory. It, okay. It can easily happen. Um, so we can try it again. Try it again, see if yep. it. We ran it about a dozen times with no error today. We come <laughs> here, it generates the error. But yeah. again, we're in Docker, we're on a laptop. This is a virtualized image. Yeah, and only we only give a quarter of the resources for this uh, computer. Okay, so second Sorry. run, it seems uh, working. And uh, uh, we can go back to our data, data table. And uh, so this, this inference 
uh, out table is whatever is generated. Uh, we just generated it. And uh, so it has uh, the predicted result compared with the legal uh, data. And then we can do some analytics too. Yeah, we can take a look and compare. So uh, here, this one, it just shows uh, the distribution of the label data. So as you can see, the number from uh, 0 to 10, they are, they are uniformly distributed. Uh, all of them are about 1,000. And uh, for our prediction, it seems like uh, uh, the prediction on 4 is very little. So this, uh, it didn't pr uh, predict very well on 4. But keep in mind, this one, this model we only trained for 7 seconds. We didn't train like 7 hours. And we are training on this small little computer. And uh, also, we can take a look and see the correct rate. It's about 60%. Uh, uh, I'll see. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. You, you could show them the SQL um, window, too, where we could do analytics. Oh, SQL. yeah, sure. And also uh, for our database, SQL Lab, and we have a we have a review which can do a lot of different things, including the SQL, and also you can make some uh, plot from here as well. So here I'm just showing you uh, if I if I run this query, it is going to show you uh, for the number you predict from uh, zero to nine, and uh, how many uh, counts you have, and how many prediction is correct, uh, how many predictions is incorrect versus how many prediction is correct. Right. Yeah. And, and again, any, a lot of data scientists have taken this to heart. Again, they like immediately after running a model, after scoring, doing ad hoc analytics in SQL. We're doing it in a very small set of data, but this kind of performance we sustain, you know, sub-second, if you were doing this SQL on billions of rows. And again, I challenge you to do it, because we're experiencing this in the field, <coughs> if you're backed by a NoSQL stack. The NoSQL stack will not efficiently use the same amount of, the same quantum of memory, GPU, CPU. It really does depend on how you co-locate those resources, right? Again, in NoSQL, the emphasis on separating them. Separate compute, separate data farms. You don't get locality that way. Not to mention in, internally, when we're in CPU, for example, we're trying to be highly cache local. We, we leverage GPUs appropriately. So, this, this results in more efficient models, and more greater throughput. Um, the faster and the more models you can execute, the more qualitative they are. Because let's, let's be honest, in the, no, most scientists, the first few go-arounds, they don't get the best models. You, you overfit, you underfit, you got to keep crunching and trying different ways to do it and compare and juxtapose until you settle on something. So that's the value proposition we're bringing. Um, Real quickly, I know my CEO Amit is waiting to talk. He's going to talk about the geospatial dimension. But before I do that, I just want to make one quick last reference to how we deployed this in a massive scale at a retailer. Again, this is, this is that use case where it was just forecasting um, visits, how many times a person was going to visit um, a store. So if his membership is going to inspire, intelligently prompt them. Don't become a nuisance. Um, we had a non-parametric Python model. Um, in practice, again, this is how we deployed it. Okay? We had the base tables okay, sharded, distributed. Then we applied SQL. We wrote SQL. Um, the data scientists themselves took their original Python code, um, gutted it, rewrote the pre-processing in SQL, and then instead of the Python model having um, distinct um, flat files and marshalling uh, many data frames, one primary data frame and two minor data frames of 100 rows each that were replicated everywhere, simplified the model. Um, these are classifications tables, you know, classifiers, basically. So, because they classify people into members into, that, that impacts the forecast. And then you run the UDFs um, in Python, a massively parallel processing fashion. You write them back into memory. Um, we were able to hit five minute SLAs. And again, this is a little more elaborate diagram. 
Um, again, the sharding, we, this is the scheduling. So 2, 2 a.m. Um, was the last piece of data came in. Okay, some pre-processing the base tables. Um, we run SQL, um, model pre-processing SQL. And this was literally about dozens of SQL statements. Again, the data science has quickly mastered SQL. They understood set-oriented SQL, worked with their DBAs together, and did the minimal amount of processing in the model. So they were able to hit their SLAs. They needed this to be done in 45 minutes every night. We were hitting it in five minutes. The NoSQL solutions were taking the better part of a day. So you don't get the turnaround. Okay. Again, this is in practice. This is what we're seeing in the field. And the model, and this one was non-parametric. He showed you a parametric model. Um, I'm doing this at investment banks now, too. So where, where they get, they're doing bar calculations, value at risk, um, streaming. They do this all at night. They collect all the trades, and only at night they reconcile them for risk. They don't do it um, real time because, again, they're ingesting into a NoSQL stack. And then what they do is later that NoSQL stack, they use something called Symphony, an IBM product. It schedules each trade to be executed either in Python or Java. If it's Python, I know what they're doing is then they get the data from HDFS, some data from uh, key value stores, ship it to one process, do a lot of processing uh, aggregation that SQL could have done, and then they this call CUDA code. But in order to run the CUDA, then they take those intermediate results, ship it over um, in a Mesos governed architecture to a GPU farm. Whereas again, we can do it in flight, in memory, um, because the trade will fall to a shard where it has all the data in memory that it needs, so you can quickly run the Monte Carlos and quickly score it for risk and say go or no. You don't have to wait a day. You wait a day, you may not find a buyer the next day for the trade. So, Just wanting to see if we got anything. Yeah, this just kind of shows you what the results were. I, I didn't update this, but anyway, um, the historical ingest, um, and then it was taking um, a day, well over a day, we were able to do 45, and the dailies processing for this model, we were able to provision for, execute it well, five minutes, well, well under their 45 minute window, um, 10 node cluster that I've been kept talking about. So again, our, our claim to fame is that locality of memory, um, being a database called locality of GPU, CPU, provisioning for models, hammering it with streams, and supporting fast querying. Okay, so sorry for being rushed, in, but um, I'll introduce our CEO who started this whole endeavor. So there's a history. He, he founded the company, um, the U.S. Army. Um, I'm a former U.S. Army officer, military intelligence, so that was one of my attractions for joining this man in this endeavor. Yeah. All okay, yours. Okay. All right, uh, I'm Amit Vij, uh, one of the co-founders and CEO of Medica, and really uh, tying in geospatial to what you guys have learned with machine learning and AI. So, you know, like enterprises uh, have, or just industry has the challenge of IoT, uh, industrial IoT and consumer IoT. So, you know, this project related to smart city, uh, smart grid, connected car, all of these you know, projects, programs have a variety of different industrial sensors. And then on the consumer side, you know, people have uh, smart wearables, like smart phones, smart watches. Uh, in, in your house, you can have like Nest devices. Uh, I just picked up recently like a three pack of Amazon Dots. You know, and uh, enterprises are leveraging these different types of sensors. <laughs> Try to use this together as enriching this intelligence with machine learning and deep learning. Better? Yeah. All right, good. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, enterprises are leveraging, you know classic, well, now classic technologies like Hadoop and Spark, and, uh, you know, all of these technologies many times are become batch-oriented, 
Uh, so, you know, these technologies are usually I.O. bound or compute bound. And that's why we're leveraging, you know, GPUs from NVIDIA to use the massive parallel processing uh, of these devices. And, uh, you know, we're trying to make Kinetica very simple, a simple, you know, database platform where it is your relational database. You can do in-database analytics, enrich your data with machine learning and deep learning. And if your data has a geospatial component to it, you know, we have a native GIS object type with GPU accelerated functions for that. Uh, so just a brief tutorial on GIS. You know, you have two types of GIS uh, data. So it's, uh, you have raster data, which is like your images, or your um, pictures, right? And then on the other side, you have vector data. And these are like points, lines, polygons. And uh, tracks is something we created a few years ago. And this is really like a, a, a line, a geospatial line that has a temporal component tied to it. And uh, you know, we, we created this specifically in the military as we were tracking entities across time. But in the commercial space, this is very good for you know, logistics and supply chain management um, and as we are deployed in one of the largest logistics companies in the world, United States Postal Service, which I'll get into. You know, built into our database, we have spatial operations. So you can do, you know, intersections, buffers, geofencing, uh, organizations, you know, that are doing connected car are now leveraging, you know, our uh, spatial join capability so, you know, you, you can have like a uh, fact table with hundreds of billions of rows and a dimension table with regions and doing a, you know, spatial join on this where normally this will take hours or days to compute and we can do this in a few seconds. Uh, so built into our da database also is a distributed visualization pipeline. So, you know, one of the largest bottlenecks in a software architecture stack is moving data from, you know, from the database to an analytics engine to a visualization uh, engine. So we're trying to short circuit many of those steps and, uh, as, and we're leveraging the GPU to render server side pictures that are created on the fly. And uh, this is actually wrapped in a OGC compliant web service, a WMS service, and uh, we can push out to KML as well. So, you know, any geospatial client such as Esri, Google, Open Layers can communicate with us and uh, you know see your data. So uh, this is like a reference architecture. Uh, as I said, we many times function as the vector data warehouse, and uh, really, as Mate said, we really focus in on you know high velocity big data feeds. Uh, so this can be a variety of different sensors and. In the military, we had over 200 different data feeds, and we were able to simultaneously ingest these data feeds, run various types of analytics on them, many times very complex, and then visualize that data on a web browser in sub-second time. And, uh, you know, many times uh, some of the losses are like, um, like if you leverage like NoSQL databases or even like legacy databases like Oracle and SAP, they really leverage, you know, indexes and delta indexes. And uh, if you have a very high velocity data feed, let's say, let's say like net uh, PCAP data or NetFlow data for cyber intelligence, um, many times these technologies can't keep up with this data because, you know, the indexes take more and more time to, um, you know, develop and they can never catch up. And, Organizations many times have to have like a coop site where they're catching up to this data and then promote that to production. So, you know, with Kinetica, we have open interfaces uh, and we have an ODBC, JDBC connector so we can connect to your, you know, authoritative data store. And uh, also, you know, we communicate uh, with various different GIS technologies such as Esri ArcGIS, which we're a great partner with. As I said, we disseminate this data as a raster image uh, that's wrapped in an OGC compliant WMS service. And then uh, classical use cases. So with Kinetica, you know, there's three major areas we focus in on. 
It's fast ingest, as I was saying, and uh, many times this is big data, uh, you know, tens of millions of objects. Uh, many times we have production customers with hundreds of billions of objects, and we're doing joins, replicated joins, with 40, 50 million rows, and uh, getting a sub-second response. And then, you know, organizations are enriching their intelligence with machine learning and deep learning. Uh, we package in, actually, TensorFlow with Kinetica now. And uh, so different use cases, as I said, supply chain management, uh, replenishment. You know, many times organizations don't know what is going into their distribution center, and it takes them several hours and days to compute this. Uh, with our technology, you know, we're on a scale-out architecture, and we can do this in seconds. Uh, predictive delivery, you know, like, as I said, I'll double click into United States Postal Service, but uh, when we first started with USPS uh, back in 2014, they were getting more historical analytics on, you know, what is the time uh, that this postal carrier uh, goes from their distribution center to the end delivery point, what they call the last mile. Uh, now they're doing predictive analytics and uh, basically Within a 15-minute window now, they can tell a cu customer when their mail is going to be delivered. And, you know, this is a, I was, uh, have you guys heard of Michelangelo's, uh, the Michelangelo framework from Uber? Uh, that was, came out probably a month or two ago. So uh, this kind of sort of, I mean, like, it kind of validates our thesis, you know, of having a full data um, data science model pipeline and being a relational database where you can run these analytics and then launch, you know, UDFs or user-defined functions, which are, you know, like registering machine learning libraries and then enriching your data and it becomes like a cyclical uh, process, right? You're constantly learning, evolving, and improving your inference. Um, so. To get into, you know, like our use case with the United States Army Intelligence Command, this customer back in 2009, 2010, they were on a relational database. It was Oracle 10GR2, uh, where our chief science advisor said, you know, I have never seen 10 million points be filtered in my life. And we actually ran this query on a rack of Oracle 10GR2, and it took Oracle 92 minutes to run a simple geospatial query like that. So when we developed, you know, our first release, our beta release for Kinetica, on a laptop we could do uh, 10 million points in, like, millis uh, microseconds, actually, and 100 million points in a couple milliseconds. And I remember, you know, back in 2009, we did a billion points in two seconds on a laptop. So with this, you know, demonstration to our science advisor, he's, he said, let's put GPUs into the data center for the first time. So uh, this was, you know, how we kind of got started, and uh, uh, our next, you know, commercial client, and our first commercial client was United States Postal Service. So this organization has over 200,000 postal carriers delivering mail every day, and uh, they were on a relational database where, you know, it, it couldn't keep up with this data feed, which was basically each postal carrier was given a scan device that was emitting their geospatial breadcrumb every one minute. And, uh, you know, they were on a in-memory relational database, and it just uh, it couldn't keep up, and they had to partition their data every day, every hour, and then every 15 minutes, and uh, it still continued to crash. So, you know, they got to know us uh, through a partner of ours, and... Uh, Within a week, uh, we were able to ingest their data, and uh, for the first time in history, like, actually, I mean, when we ingested their data, it's kind of funny. Uh, within their uh, single, like, a, a data table, they actually had a million delivery points in, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, and that's where zero, zero is. So it's interesting to have, like, a, a relational database that has a visualization pipeline. So you know what you're ingesting, right? So that, especially if that has a geospatial uh, dimension to it, you can see your data. 
But uh, this organization, you know, we're involved. First, it, it, they wanted to get a historical perspective on what is the time it takes uh, for this postal carrier to deliver mail. And through time, you know, they got into route optimization, and uh, they fused together different data feeds like weather and traffic to get a better idea of, you know, when mail will be delivered. Uh, so once we got into production, you know, for the first time in history, USPS could see the entire mail distribution, uh, uh, mail workforce in real time. And uh, after that, we got involved in tracking their entire mail distribution. Um, so that was a great success for us. And uh, so another area is oil and gas. So, you know, this is a small, probably a hundred, couple hundred person company, R RS Energy Group. And they try pretty much every single technology to do, you know, various different analytics on drilling. And uh, normally, you know, this organization could only analyze like a zip code, like an area that was like a, a zip code. But uh, they wanted to analyze the entire United States to get a better perspective on, you know, what is the best area next to drill as it costs north of a million dollars for each, you know, hole in the earth. So they were a, they got connected to us and pretty much we enabled them to you know, take multiple different data feeds and enrich their intelligence, and they leverage machine learning and deep learning to to figure out, you know, and tell their clients where they should, you know, drill next. And uh, this, and we deployed out on just a few nodes on Amazon, uh, AWS, you know, on EC2. So this is another one with connected car and. Uh, you know, I bet like everyone here uses Uber and Uber Eats. And if you've used an Uber Eats, you know, this is a pretty complicated machine learning uh, problem uh, that's constantly evolving to actually predict when is my food going to be, you know, coming to my ha like house. So from the point you order your food from your phone, you know, that message is pushed to Uber and then to that restaurant. And through time, you know, Uber is getting analytics on the time each restaurant takes to make this you know, type of food, and then what is the best time uh, to dispatch you know, a driver to pick up that food and ultimately deliver that to the end user. Uh, so when I was talking about Mike, the Michelangelo framework that Uber has now developed, you know, this is this constant cycle that's you know, taking streaming data feeds, uh, wrapping in machine learning, deep learning, that has a geospatial you know, dimension to it uh, to get more predictive and accurate results to the end user. Uh, I'll get into a few demos now. I know we're getting late in time, so I'm going to try to speed up some things. See if this look OK. So, um, yeah, as I said, we're a relational database, and built into us, we have a dis distributed visualization pipeline. So every time I zoom in or out, this is like a 200 kilobyte PNG image uh, that's generated on the fly. So we're not, you know, uh, caching or indexing or anything like that. And uh, this, is lev uh, this is actually flight data from the FAA, ASDI flight data. And I just clicked on a location, and you can see I got a cursor north of uh, 3.4 million results. So uh, as I keep, you know, uh, cursoring through, you can see how flights are traveling. And this is leveraging our unique track type that I was talking about before. And uh, so I'm going to do an arbitrary filter here. I'm going to start typing. We do a distinct on the fly uh, and pick a... Uh, say O'Hare Airport in Chicago. So very quickly, I go from 828 million positions to 17 million positions. We're recalculating the histogram on the fly, re-rendering the map, and uh, you can see you know, everything is, all the flights that are leaving uh, O'Hare there. Next, I can do a temporal filter against this, right? 
We're not saying last one day, last 15 days, last month. Uh, as many times, organizations have to do this and generate materialized views that are updated nightly or every 15 minutes. And then uh, I can do an arbitrary altitude filter. So show me all flights above 32,223 feet. And uh, do click filter, and then pretty much instantly, you know, we're, this is sending multiple different queries to the database and getting out results in sub-second time. So you can see it takes a little bit of distance before flights get above that altitude. So, uh, you know, we have a variety of different uh, questions. Any, you know. This is actually, this was created by Esri. Uh, this is completely JavaScript. And it's uh, talking, uh, we have a JavaScript uh, binding as well and leverage Node.js, but this is a third party partner of ours, Esri, that we're leveraging their base maps, those raster images, and then we're populating the map on top with the vector data that we're filtering on the fly. So uh, I, I just went into simple feature mode and uh, now you can see the actual, you know, the, the actual features. And I'm going to change, so we give you fine-grained uh, handles to the visualization aspects of it. And right now it looks like a blob, but as I zoom in, this is millions of points and lines and the flights, and you can see how flights are traveling through time, right, based on that filter that I, I had created. And uh, we, I'm just going to click on an area. We interpolate where you click. And uh, you can see you know, the flights that are at that time in that region uh, that have re uh, met that altitude parameter. So you know, no technology can really do this in the world. So this is a really strong area. And you know, enriching this data with machine learning, deep learning, makes enterprises even more powerful. Uh, so uh, this is ship data, very similar to flight. Uh, as I zoom in, you know, the Navy can't see their data unless they have us, you know, with this, uh, I mean, you can see how, like, you know, ships travel and they're quite uniform. And this is 112 million flights, uh, ship uh, positions. And if I dwell into this region, you can see you know, like the concentric circles that ships have, uh, where ships have been dwelling before they port. And uh, these tracks of ships are a lot more complicated. Um, so you can, see, I mean, you can see how valuable this can be to, you know, in the commercial space for, for organizations. Uh, as we are, as I said, a relational database, here's a handle to all the different attributes of the ship data table. So I can just click on vessel type and start just typing, do a distinct on the fly again on 112 million points, click oil, uh, sorry, tanker, and now I have all ships of type tanker. So I'm just going to click here in an arbitrary location, and you can see that all these ships are of type tanker. And then I can fuse this together with you know, full text search. So I just push in oil. And uh, now you can see that all these guys are going to Malay oil terminal. So yeah, to another demonstration here is uh, I'm going to go to our reveal framework. And uh, this is cyber data, cyber net flow data from our uh, offices in Arlington, Virginia, and uh, San Francisco. This is the only thing that's not GPU accelerated right now. So this is like a graph uh, that we're creating uh, through JavaScript and seeing communication of NetFlow data. So uh, if I click on a location, you know, you can see the attributes of this uh, data. So you have source IP address, destination IP address, the ports that are affiliated, and most importantly is like the event type. Uh, so you can have different types of events, create, delete, denied, uh, and you can see the distribution of all these events. So uh, it was interesting. We started using Reveal, and we drew a polygon around you know, China. And uh, it was very fascinating for us to see that a majority 
of the events in China, like our firewall is actually denying them because it sees like some malicious behavior in that. Uh, so, you know, just leveraging our visualization framework, I can drill into denied. And you can see, you know, the IP addresses that are communicating to and from us and of the denied event and the you know, top source IP addresses and the top destination IP addresses. And next, I can just do like arbitrary timeline filter and everything updates on the fly. So this is you know, 407 million uh, NetFlow packets. Uh, so all of this is all working off a production cluster that is eight nodes uh, with billions of records. I can even uh, show you our G admin tool uh, so these guys had showed you um, different aspects of our administration tool. What's, you know, just to put it all together, this, you know, cluster has over 11 billion objects. And if I go into data, these are all the different queries, you know, that were ran. And uh, we're a relational database with schemas and all. So this master schema had t over 10 billion records and uh, we're ingesting data, you know, constantly. So uh, that flight, you know, tracking data table that I had ran queries off of, here you can see the different attributes. You can annotate specific columns and say, you know, G these, I want GPU accelerated. Uh, the other ones I want to be text searchable. And other ones I just want to store to disk. So you have the flexibility of you know, being efficient with your hardware and, and if you know your data and, you know, put data in the right, leverage the hardware where you need it. Uh, so if I go into ta uh, table info, here's, you know, my column types and how they're typed. Uh, and here's my Avra schema. Uh, so one last demo is, uh, this is, you know, Actually, we created this back in 2012 with, for the military. So, you know, around 2011, we generated, started generating pictures on the fly. So, our na like, natural evolution was generating videos on the fly uh, at the time of query. So, you know, common problem in, like, the military it wants to know is, like, uh, they want to analyze a particular area. So this Intel analyst, you know, drew this polygon, this triangle, and that's their area of interest. And they want to know anything that intersected that triangle that's going 37 miles per hour or greater, that's a white wagon. So, you know, previously we could generate pictures, but with time we were able to generate unique, you know, videos that are dynamically created on the fly in a matter of seconds. And, uh, you know, the same query, applying a heat map filter to this, uh, or heat map render to this, you can actually see activity here. So, you know, after this, with this type of capability, you can take, you know, seeing data and how things are moving and push this, leveraging machine learning, deep learning, to classify those as events and get into activity-based intelligence. So, you know, with track data, you, uh, you can figure out if, you know, a car is making a left turn, a right turn, a U-turn. So if you're Uber and your driver is making five U-turns within four minutes, you know, you know this driver isn't safe or he doesn't know this area or he's just trying to, you know, run up the tab. So leveraging, you know, software, you can be very intelligent, start creating decision trees and, uh, yeah, optimize your business. Just uh, through this, uh, this is Oz oh, sorry. ozone widget framework. So this is they were just leveraging our RESTful endpoints, and uh, this data is just a series of maybe a couple hundred PNG images, and they were leveraging Google Earth uh, that these PNG images were pushed out into. Other questions? Very good. Yeah, so you still need, so you're really tracking all of the long lag and what our data points. Do you still need a map layer, whether it's from our 
GIS right. or Google or whatever. Yes. As I said, like we leverage those, you know, map providers for the base map imagery. So whether that's, you know, uh, I can e show you an example of this also. Well, so here's, here's another scenario, right? So let's take a look at something like Tableau, who has no street maps, for example. Yep. Right, so you're essentially saying, hey, I'll store, and I, I can deal with geospatial time, <laughs> I will store those, I'll collect them and store them. But then something like a Tableau or Correct. Uh, whatever, SuperSets, whatever, Correct. So uh, <laughs> if I, um, I'll just show Twitter for instance here. This is over four billion, you know, tweets, and uh, I can just go in here, change it to street maps. I can go into imagery, and that's exactly what you were asking for. You know, this can be. This is Open Street Map. Uh, so we're the vector data map on top of those, you know, raster tiles. Okay. And then with tracking, let's just want to route tracking. Yep. That's all done in the database, in database analytics, and then push out a PNG image. We abide by uh, Open Geospatial Consortium, uh, so it's an OGC, and so all our data is held as WKT, well-known text, which is a, a standard in GIS. And uh, we can read and write shape files, but many times, you know, our data are billions of objects. Uh, so we can even, you know, push out HDFS files or read and write RDB files. But for Tableau and things, you know, they can leverage our ODBC, JDBC driver for that. So I haven't visited your website. So you, you, what's your product? Product is software database, or it, software product and also an appliance? Uh, it's purely software, but uh, we partner with a variety of different hardware vendors. Uh, NVIDIA with their DGX1 machine and station, you can deploy us out on a cluster. Uh, but we also work and are certified with Dell, HP, Cisco, uh, IBM. But we're just pure software. Okay, so the GPE... DB, GPU DB uh, figure earlier on one, one of the slides, either your presentation or the previous one. The, the user has to install all of that. They have to buy the, the workstation for NVIDIA and then get your software and then fully manage that box themselves. I mean, it's just we work on a laptop even. So we work on commodity hardware. So what you saw you know, in the beginning was uh, we, we require NVIDIA GPUs, uh, but uh, yeah, that you can be deployed on any type of server. So they had showed the DGX1 machine with, you know, so many different GPUs. And How about that pipeline that the previous presenter was talking about, the 10-node thing and you know, the 10-node cluster? Yeah, so that's just you have a rack of 10 nodes, and uh, you can network, you know, we don't require very high-end, networking fabric. So we work, this is running off of a one gigabit backend system. Uh, 10 gigabit would be phenomenal for us, but we don't require it. Uh, InfiniBand, you know, organizations, if they have it, will be even more faster, but we shard the data across nodes. So, and uh, just, we roll up the aggregates so that it doesn't require that much network traffic. But uh, yeah, I mean, we take advantage of you know, what's in the data center for enterprises, or even work under your, um, you know, desk on workstation. So, so, for example, you talked about use case of US Postal Service. So you are tracking all the mail and all that. So the data is basically coming as a streaming, right? Yes. So, so what is the uh, bandwidth of that data? Is it 10 gig or 20 gig? I, I'm not particularly sure what is uh, the bandwidth of the data, but I can say that you know they have around 215 or a thousand people, uh, each with a mobile device oh. emitting their breadcrumb every one minute. And this just recently, last quarter, they moved from analyzing and ingesting that data every one minute to every one second. And uh, what Matei was saying actually before, on that benchmark with regards to the ingestion, this was a 10 node cluster of Kinetica, and we, did, we simulated a bulk, well, we ran a bulk ingest job through MapReduce on a 20 node Hadoop cluster. 
And uh, basically, we were ingesting at 4 billion objects a minute with primary key off and 1.3 billion objects a minute with primary key on. And to give you a comparison, you know, SAP HANA was ingesting at 1 billion objects an hour. So where we're 1.3 billion objects a minute, there are 1.3 billion objects an hour. And while we're ingesting, we can run analytics uh, at the time of you know, ingestion. I work for SAP and I worked on HANA. And as a retailer, I'm working on use cases where we're supplanting HANA. Uh, one thing to this point that I like to see in the field is competitors, especially people competitors, ingest. I, I, I challenge you to ingest in Oracle and HANA the way you, you do for us. Someone asked me earlier, uh, do we all have to go through the head? No, we don't. No. That's one advantage. And then we have optimizations, other optimizations, for why we can ingest in a high rate. Uh, HANA, you have to go through the head node. I believe Oracle, you have to go through a head node as well, right? How do you compare to uh, AWS uh, database server services right now? Like, especially the ones that Redshift and all? Uh, Red Redshift, Shift? Redis, Elastic. We're, we're going to blow them out. Uh, we've well, done they have in memory solutions right now, right? Yeah, but they well, all. But they can scale up like massively with EC2, right? Right. I mean, we've ran, so. we ran multiple different benchmarks. We're blowing out Redshift and other BigQuery from Google. Uh, just, you know, they're still built upon legacy data models that were created a couple decades ago. Uh, and they're not leveraging the parallelism that you get from GPUs. So uh, how do you compare against MAPD? MAPD is, I mean, I feel we have years of maturity. Uh, really, we are distributed. So I feel like, I mean, and maybe recently they've become distributed. To, but for my knowledge, uh, they're still single node based, where we have enterprise solutions with 60, 80 nodes deployed out in HA mode. And what is your software uh, licensing model? Or, um... uh, it depends on the organization, but really we license based on the amount of data you have. So they have a built-in uh, visualization tool for geospatial data, MapD. Yes. So, but you don't have that? We, I mean, we give what we call Reveal, okay. but that's actually an open source product that we're partnering with Airbnb. Okay. and leveraging their Caravel, or now they call it Superset. Mm -hmm. But really, visualization is not our prime focus. It's really the, the, you know, the mechanics of the back-end system, you know, the database. So the level of SQL maturity that we have, you know, our competitors do not have, and probably several years behind us. And just the robustness, the maturity, and the, the thread management, the, the node management, the communication, all of this has been you know, thought out for years and perfecting over time. So your SQL is SQL 92 compliant? SQL. We have SQL 92 compliant plus you know, functions from 2001, 2003, even some from 2011. Really depends on, you know, like really our customers are driving our roadmap. Uh, we're, we just uh, are going to be launching our 6.1 release where we're pushing out over 80 geospatial functions uh, because PGE helped require, uh, you know, uh, push those out faster for us. But yeah, I mean, uh, another thing for you guys to know is by the end of the month, we'll be pushing out our 6.1 release that you can try out for 90 days and, and run it on a, a cluster of nodes. I would say on the low end, if you're running very trivial operations, you're probably around you know 20 milliseconds or so. I mean, you, you know, you have the travel time of the data and to ultimately to the browser to your end GUI. So there's network traffic in that, but we're really focused in on use cases that are not you know zero to twenty, but more you know analytical use cases that are you you need to get within a second. And a, and a high throughput. So earlier I mentioned 600 to 1,200 queries a second. Again, and that was on a 
table produced from a 100 billion row fact table, we produced every five minutes a summary table to facilitate that. It wound up being a billion rows, but a base query would run in 50 milliseconds. But what was important was when we went from highly concurrent 600 to 1200 queries a second, the latency only rose to 250 milliseconds or less. That's very tolerable for that kind of throughput and uh, that kind of latency. So that, that's what we bring. Um, Oracle, I remember we were doing some comparisons of Oracle on that. And the, they were able to achieve, uh, when they went and designed an OLTP based table for this, beating us on the single query. But as they had to do, as we shifted to a more analytic query um, off that summary table, as you scaled up from 600 to 1200 a second, then their latency went dramatically up, way past the, the sub-second. None of these databases, I think, that you mentioned earlier, correct me someone if, if I'm wrong, but Redshift, Oracle, whatever, they're not using GPUs. So yeah. they cannot have the density of compute that we have. And, you know, Amid and, uh, Amid, sorry, Amid and Nima, Megamodel, the founders, you guys engineered it that way, you, with CUDA in mind. Right. We started as a geospatial and temporal computational first. So, you know, you just don't create a database overnight. Uh, so it took us a number of years to, re to get to SQL 92 compliancy, uh, as we first were just a geospatial computational engine. But, uh, yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of years of engineering that has uh, been poured into us to get to where we are now. So when you run SQL on GPUs, so what percentage of the cores you'll be able to keep them busy? Are you able to use all the cores? Or? Yeah, we leverage all the cores, uh, but yeah, I mean, saturating the GPUs, and that's the, the challenge of GPU computing, right? And your bottleneck then becomes the PCI Express bus. Yeah. Uh, so moving, you know, chunking the data, uh, we're d distributed, right? So you, we require we'd like to have all your data in system RAM and then chunking the data uh, to and from the GPU. So it depends on the amount of VRAM you have, and you know, 12 gigabytes, 16 gigabytes. We're asking Nvidia to put more in their next release that hopefully is coming out soon. But yeah, that's ultimately the bottleneck to you know fully you know thrash. I mean, saturate the GPUs and have them always working. So in all your use cases, you know, the bottleneck is the PCA Express bandwidth and uh, the local memory bandwidth. Correct. We also have another mode, which we call like VRAM boost, uh, which basically you, you put all your data, your entire data table is all in VRAM. So you don't have any data movement whatsoever. So like for your most critical you know, calculations, that data in motion, you keep it all in VRAM, and there's no movement, and you get the fastest results with that. And by the way, it's an integrated optimizer, right? So we won't do every operation initially in, in, in the GPU. So filtering, for example, will only send a minimal amount. You have to pull it from main RAM anyway. You might as well use the CPU. We're NUMA aware when we're in CPU. So we get, we're intelligent about it. We, we, we'll govern. A query plan, send only what needs to be sent. Uh, we'll, as Amit said, we'll pin certain tables. You could pin, for example, even a, a replicated table, small uh, dimensional tables, and only send the filter chunks down to the GPU for leveraging the parallels. That's how we get the highest throughput. So the database that you are running on GPUs is a relational database manager? What is that? The database you are running on GPUs, is it a relational database or? Yes. Okay. I had shown the you know, G admin and you could see, I mean, we're a commoner data store, but for the end user, they see a relational database. Oh. And the bonus is you can run your model pipelines on there as well. You can also segregate it out. You can have this, again, to, to the point we were making earlier, you can do all this model training and running and do it on a subset of the GPU reserving a certain amount for the database to keep uh, throughput high for analytics. So, for example, you talked about 10 node cluster. So each node know what kind of network connectivity it has. Is it a 10 gig? Yeah, cluster? I mean, many times 10 gig is normally our major enterprises have. One gig is 
you know, for the small companies and us, we're leveraging one gig, but normally it's just 10 gig. So if you bump it to 100 gig, you know, does it help you? It's, it depends on your use case. You know, if it's cyber traffic and we're analyzing net flow data, PCAP data, you know, that data is many times coming in at 10 gigabit, 40 gigabits per second. So that's really when we require, you know, fast network fabric between the nodes. Uh, but it depends on your use case and how fast your streaming data is coming in. So the gating factor, I would say, is we can digest from a stream as fast as this can consume it, too. So that's another threshold to consider. Yeah, nowadays no, you have an array of SSD arrays are available, so plenty of bandwidth is available. Yeah, yeah. But we try to maintain an equilibrium. Uh, to we said earlier, we try to minimize data shipping. Like good mature optimizers try, and DBAs work together. The, the optimizer recognizes what the DBAs have done in terms of sharding and, and replication to do data reduction as much as possible. So, and one gentleman mentioned redshift. So. Redshift, I believe, is from Bar Excel lineage, which is a Natiza lineage. I work for Natiza as well. Which so, is a Postgres lineage. Right. That is not a mature optimizer. <laughs> how would, have, have you heard about MemSQL? Yes, I have. Yeah, yeah. yeah in We're displacing data. them too. So how, how do we compare uh, SQL? We, we have benchmarks, but we're, we're taking them out in a few counts too. Oh. I'm competing against them right now in a cable TV provider. So the use case is we have to adjust every five seconds 25,000 rows that upsert into a 20 million. I talked about a small use case. That's one. So the, we have to do the upsert in less than a second. Um, MemSQL can handle it. The reason we're getting our shot is MemSQL crashes several times a week under that pressure and the rest. Every two days, yeah. That, that, that's, that's an example of a smaller scale but high velocity use case. Yeah, that's when, you know, like, as I said, these legacy databases, they're good if it's slow data or static data. You can index your way out of your, you know, calculations because you, you already know what's going to be asked. But, like, if you have a constant data stream coming in, you, your index, indexes can't catch up. And that's when these databases start falling down. Yeah. That was a Kafka stream. Because you're using GPU, so you don't calculate the indexes up front. So, uh, real yeah, time, we, no? we don't really leverage indexes that uh, acutely, uh, but we do, you know, lightly index when needed. Uh, we have clever, uh, you know, techniques to find data, but uh, because we have so much firepower with the GPUs, we don't really need to leverage uh, indexes as much. It, it, it depends. We, we, we have it. We can use it. When, but again, to this point, most cases you don't. Yeah. There may be some tight cases. If you want thousands of queries a second, we might use it. Again, we're not all OTP. The indices, if we do use them in conjunction with a, a summary table, it's again, it's for real fast analytics. Um, they're not OLTP. They're analytics um, to sustain high throughput. But the fact is we can materialize these tables very quickly. Try it on a SQL database. First of all, you're not going to bomb the SQL database anyway with, with constant streaming. Now, my, conversely, you can bomb no SQL, but you're not going to create the summary table in any fast period of time to provision flow. And you're not going to do the fast analytics. That, that's really, honestly, as simple as that sounds. That's how we position ourselves. And it's an outcome of why we're here. You're a GPU where guys like Alex have done in his life. We're leveraging it that way. Yeah, I hate to cut, I'm going to, don't want to get this raffle done. These guys are going to be hanging around for a few more minutes um, if you guys have some more questions and stuff. But I uh, want to thank Alex, Mate, and uh, Ahmed for coming on board. If you can drop a business card or a name tag in here, I'm going to draw all of them right now and give away two of these NVIDIA Shield TVs that they Graciously donated. So if you didn't drop a name tag in here, now's your time. Uh, name tag or business card. So I'll pull, I'll pull out two and we'll. Uh, the, the only thing is, you got to take a, a picture holding the <laughs> NVIDIA Shield for me. <laughs> All right. Anybody else?
Matt, say, come up here and you pick one of these. Have any of you, does anyone here do database kernel engineering? Like, not query optimizing? By any chance? Or Tom doesn't Just. I'll also pick one of our, our lucky winners. <laughs> Good job. Thank you. <laughs> John Holditch. Did I say that right? Good job. All right. All right, John. There's one, and then the second one is going to be Old John Sharka. All right, perfect. Cool. I'm going to take photos of you guys by the whiteboard here. If you guys have more questions, I mean, uh, all the talkers are still here. I'm sure they can kind of go on a one-on-one -on -one basis with you. But thanks for coming out, everybody.